Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Miller. Every week, I chat with fascinating people from all walks of life in order to bring you knowledge, inspiration, and insight. If you enjoy the show, you can support it by subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing it with a friend. This is the Jeremy Miller Podcast. All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the podcast. I am going to do a recap of the Chicago Marathon weekend, uh, and I also put out a Q&A poll on Instagram to get some questions from you guys to see what you want to know about, what you want me to talk about on this Q&A episode. Uh, and I'm just going to preface all of this by saying I am so bad at solo podcasts. I am very jealous and I envy anybody who can do solo podcasts because these are hard. It seems so simple to sit down and talk for 30, 45 minutes, however long, but when there's nobody to like engage with and I'm just sitting here talking to myself, it's so challenging. So anybody that does solo podcasts, kudos to you because this stuff is hard. Uh, but basically, I'm just going to go through all of the questions you guys submitted. Uh, I basically went through them and tried to compile them as much as I could into like you know, generalized questions. A lot of you guys ask very specific things, but a lot of you guys also asked questions that were uh, all kind of similar generally. So I've got like 20-ish questions here that I'll kind of just go through um, and I'll try to sort of do it chronologically as the race progressed, even starting back all the way to my training uh, through the race week, through traveling to Chicago, race morning, going through the race, uh, post-race, basically everything involved with the Chicago Marathon. Uh, I'll try and provide as much information, as much knowledge and value to you guys so that hopefully you can learn something from my experience, take something away from this. I think that you will. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot. Each marathon that I do, I learn something new every single time, uh, and this one was no different. So hopefully, again, you can take something away from my experience and use it to apply to your next marathon, your next race, whatever it might be, uh, so you can PR, hit the goals you want to and uh, become a better, faster, and stronger runner as a whole. So with that being said, just a quick kind of overview of how the marathon went for me. My goal was sub 245, two hours and 45 minutes, uh, and I ended up running a 244.11, two hours, 44 minutes, 11 seconds, which came out to a 616 average pace per mile. Uh, I believe that's about three minutes and 54 seconds per kilometer, uh, the United States and our Imperial number system, uh, gotta love it. But overall, I was very, very pleased with the results from the weekend. Um, I was truly very, very nervous going into this race because training through the summer here in Texas is just so brutal. This is my first time doing it and I do not do good in the heat. I don't think anybody really does good in the heat. Most of my runs are on just like a typical morning were 85 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's around like 30 degrees Celsius. So very hot, so humid here in Texas. It's typically uh, like 80 to 90% humidity, if not higher. So the feels like temperature was always a little bit warmer. You're you're sweating like five minutes into the run. Uh, Just brutal training. Uh, And it sucked for sure. But I know now that it was definitely worth it. It definitely made... A big difference going into Chicago where it was 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I think it was like 5 degrees Celsius, something like that. Uh, it, I mean, perfect conditions. Uh, Chicago is a little humid, but not nearly as humid as Texas. And actually, at a certain point, the temperature becomes cold enough that the humidity makes it feel colder rather than warmer. So that was kind of the case, which was nice. But I mean, overall, like picture perfect race weekend. Weather was money. Pacing strategy is perfect. I'll get into, get into all that stuff. Um, but as a whole, very, very happy and pleased with how the weekend turned out. So with that being said, uh, I'm just going to kind of dive into all these questions. Uh, again, give you guys as much knowledge as I can, as much information, and uh, we'll go from there. I'm going to try and not edit this at all. I'm just going to let it rip, and uh, we'll see what happens. All right, here we go. So question number one was... Uh, race week sleep tips. Um, yeah, sleep is tough before a race. A lot of it is just nerves, I think. And also if you're training properly and you, you have like a proper taper going into your race, 
Uh, obviously, you're going to have lower training volume from a strength training side and a running side, a running perspective. And so you have all this like excess energy. You know, you go from, for me, it was like running 70 miles a week to now I'm tapering and I only have like 40 or 50 miles and I have, you know, hours of extra free time. I'm feeling pretty good. And so it's hard to sleep at night because you have all this excess energy plus you're also nervous for the race. And so sleep tips for me is like, just try to stick to a consistent schedule as much as you can try to do what you normally do during race week or, or, or you know, during, during a normal, um, training week, do that. This the same for race week as much as possible. Uh, and I think that goes also for like nutrition stuff too. I feel like everybody, you know, they get to race week and like, Oh shit, it's already here. Uh, and they start like eating all these foods that they didn't normally eat. And they start, you know, doing all these stretches and like, trying to run more hills or just doing things that they didn't do during training that they probably should have done um, because they're kind of panicking at the last minute because it's race week. Uh, and so my piece of my best piece of advice is just skip all that stuff. Just do what you're used to doing. Trying to stay as consistent as possible. Uh, didn't even answer the question about sleep uh, other than consistency. It's just uh, I like to read before bed. Uh, I like to put, I try to go, be asleep by like 10 to 11 p.m. Uh, most nights and I'll keep my I'll, I'll like turn off my screens get off the computer get off the tv get off my phone uh, at least an hour before I'm trying to fall asleep and then I'll you know brush my teeth go through my routine uh, read a book for like 20 to 30 minutes and then I'll, I'll pass out after that uh, it, it's really like once I turn the lights off and I'm trying to go to sleep it it does not take me very long fortunately maybe like five to ten minutes at the most um so I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, again, the biggest piece of advice there is just be consistent. Do what you normally do. Don't freak out because it's race week and and try to do a bunch of things differently. Question number two, my mindset during race week slash uh, leading into the race. So I guess kind of the same thing is like being consistent and doing the, the normal routine. Uh, and, and I guess one thing I should preface that with is my peak week of training is typically two weeks before race week. And I try to treat that peak week of training as much like race week as I can, meaning like eating the same foods, waking up and going to sleep at the same time. Um, I guess most of those two things, sleep and food, uh, and just like the normal routine in terms of like strength training, all that stuff. I try and simulate race week as much as I can two weeks prior to the race. And I think that helps a lot uh, when it comes time for the actual race because I can just trust that, okay, I already know my plan for the week. I already did this a couple weeks ago. Uh, I've got all my ducks in a row. I don't have to like panic and worry about what I'm going to do because I've already practiced it and gone through the motions of it. And so I, I guess mindset during race week is just trusting the process and knowing like I've put in the work, I can trust my training. All I got to do is show up and execute. Um, I'll, I'll also during race week kind of just double over like my nutrition strategy, my pacing strategy. I'll like write it all down. And I think one other good point on race week mindset is knowing that all of the physical work has been put in. You're not going to gain an ounce more of fitness during race week. Like you can go out and run as hard as you freaking want three days before the race. It doesn't matter. You're not going to gain any fitness from that. And so... As long as you train properly, you can trust in that, okay, I put in all my work, I'm physically ready, now it's just getting mentally ready. The race week is all about mental preparation. Um, I guess here's another thing that I could do a whole podcast just on mental preparation, apparently. But uh, one thing that I always, always, always tell myself and plan out ahead before any race, whether it's a 5K or a half marathon, an ultra, whatever it is, is I know that inevitably at some point during the race, I'm going to reach a point where I say, this sucks. This hurts. I should just stop and walk. I don't need to do this race. Why am I out here doing this? Whatever it is, you start asking yourself all these questions and start trying to negotiate with yourself later on in the race. And it happens to everybody. And I think as long as you anticipate that happening and you expect it to happen, and then in addition to that, you have an answer prepared for yourself. When you get to that point, you'll have no issues on race day when you inevitably get to that point. And so for me uh, and, and everybody else, they have their own mantra that they tell themselves their own why. And I guess for me, it's just I told myself I'm going to 
run a 245. I put in the work. I spent months and months training. I sacrificed time with friends or family or work or other different things to, to hit this goal. And I put in all the work. So when it gets to that point at mile 20, 22, where I want to stop and walk, it's like, okay, you put in all this time and effort. Just keep going. You've got like 20 to 30 more minutes of running. Just suck it up, push through, and you'll be just fine. But if I, if for me, if I don't plan that out ahead of time and I just show up to the race, like, oh, I'll just run uh, 245 and whatever happens, happens. And then I get to that point where it hurts and it sucks and I'm not prepared, then that's usually a lot of times when you bonk or you quit on yourself and you end up walking or missing your goal time. So that's a very important point that I wanted to make. Pre-race nutrition. Everybody asks about nutrition stuff for this, uh, especially like the carb loading process. So I use this calculator for carb loading. Uh, it's from Featherstone nutrition. Uh, the girl that created it, his name is Megan. Uh, and this calculator is clutch. My coach will nation actually showed this to me, uh, when I was prepping for Boston earlier this year, but you basically plug in your height, your weight, your age, and then you plug in your goal time for your race. And then it'll spit out this number of how many carbs you should hit. It actually gives you the option to do a two-day or three-day carb load. I always opt for the three-day carb load just because uh, basically the way our glycogen system works, which glycogen is the fuel that we primarily use for running uh, marathons, the way that that glycogen system works is it's like a battery rather than like a car with a gas tank in it. You can't just like show up the night before the race eat a bunch of pasta and expect to be good. You can't just show up to the gas station, put the nozzle in, fill it up real quick and you're good to go. It's more like a battery where you have to plug it in. It's got to take some time to charge. It goes up a few percent, you know, as you go, it takes time. Um, but because of that, it can last a little bit longer. And so same, same thing, uh, for our glycogen system is it takes days to fully top off our glycogen stores. So that's where the three day carb load comes in. For me, it was about 600 grams of carbs per day. So the race was on Sunday. I started uh, Thursday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 600 grams of carbs per day. Uh, Fortunately, the first day of that, I was here at home in Austin, and I was able to just track the carbs uh, with an app. I use this free app. It's called Macros First. Uh, It's super handy. And I stuck to mostly fruit, fruit juice, dried fruit, berries, bananas, all that kind of stuff, just because it's lighter, it's easier to eat. I already eat a lot of it, so my stomach's used to it. Uh, And then I'll mix in some other things like sweet potatoes, or I try to avoid it, but uh, things like pasta uh, or rice, just because it's a little bit heavier, more dense, it weighs you down, it's harder for your stomach to digest. At some point, like during the carb load, I think you got to just get carbs in wherever you can get them, because 600 grams of carbs is a lot for me. That ends up being like 3,800 calories. And kind of the same thing as the sleep thing I was talking about is like when you're tapering, you have less training volumes. You're not burning as many calories, but you have to shove in so many calories to get those carbs up. And so it's challenging. And so I definitely try to foundationally start with like good, healthy carbs. But at some point, it's like, okay, I'll just eat this pastry or I'll, I'll eat this bowl of pasta, whatever it is. So, um, Carb loaded for three days. Uh, the day before the race, uh, I'm trying to remember what I had there for breakfast. I had some pastries. What did we have? The day before the race was a shakeout run. So yes, we had the shakeout run, and then after that, uh, Bree and I stopped by this pastry shop. I had like three or four croissants, basically. Um, and then after that, we stopped by Whole Foods. I had a whole bunch of fruit. Uh, I had a couple of sweet potatoes. They had some mac and cheese. I normally don't eat mac and cheese, but it was carbs, so I ate some of that. And then uh, had some mashed potatoes for dinner. We actually had plans to eat out at this Italian restaurant, but after the shakeout run and going to the expo and just like being on our feet all day, we would have to have taken another Uber to this Italian restaurant, and we were just tired, didn't want to get out of the hotel, and I'm like, I got to run a marathon tomorrow. Let's just chill. So we ordered in uh, Noodles & Company, and I got uh, just buttered noodles with chicken parma- crusted chicken parmesan crusted parmesan chicken on top of the butter noodles and then i had uh, a side of chicken noodle soup as well as a massive rice krispie treat so again these were definitely processed carbs it wasn't my first choice um but because i carb loaded 
three days prior to the race, I knew that that last meal wasn't like super, super essential. Uh, it is important for sure, but it's not like make or break basically. I just knew I needed some calories, needed some carbs, and that was like the best option that we had at our disposal. And it's hard when you're traveling to try and get in good stuff. So that was the carb load for the race. Uh, and then before I go into like my my race nutrition and like the morning of, I'll tell you like my, my general pacing strategy that I had going into the race. Uh, so every marathon that I've ran, every marathon where I've coached somebody where they've had a really, really good race where they hit a PR typically or hit their goal time is generally done with negative splits. Even the world record that was set in Chicago, uh, the guy Kel- Kelvin Kiptum run, ran uh, negative splits, meaning if you don't know what negative splits are. Uh, the front half of your race is a little bit slower and then the back half of your race is a little bit faster or at least like the last few miles of your race, uh, you speed up and and run a little bit quicker. So that was the plan going in. So the, uh, general pacing plan was I need to average about six seventeen per mile. So from the start to mile four, was going to be uh, anywhere from 615 to 620, just a little bit slower, uh, even all the way up to like 625 if I needed to, depending on the crowds. I kind of gave myself some wiggle room there. And so, again, start to mile four was 615 to, let's just call it 625, with the goal pace uh, for the marathon being 617. And then from mile four to mile 22 was just locking in right around goal marathon pace, somewhere between like 610 to 620, ideally hitting somewhere around like 615, 616. Uh, and then from mile 22 to the finish, the goal was to negative split from anywhere, basically anything faster than goal marathon pace. So like 617 and below. Um, and we basically nailed it right on the head. My front half, I believe I ran a 122 half and then on the back half I ended up running like a 121 so it, I just know the I don't remember the exact, the exact seconds but the back half was about 40 seconds faster than the front half um which was amazing and again I can't preach negative splits enough every really good race I've had where I feel good at the end I hit the goal time hit the PR is uh when I'm running negative splits so I would definitely encourage you uh to embrace that philosophy and, uh, and do it if you can. Next, I will go into the morning of the race nutrition as well as my uh, nutrition during the race. So morning of the race, uh, the race started at 7.30. They recommended everybody get to the starting area uh, around 5.30 or 6 a.m. So I woke up at 5 a.m. and I had a scratch Rice Krispie treat. I was eating these during all of my prep, I love these things. They're so easy to get down. They taste good. They're light. I, I used to use the Morton solids, uh, and I just can't choke those down anymore. They're a little bit too dense for me. I like the flavor, but the Morton solids are just a little too dense, and they're hard to get down uh, early in the morning. So I switched to the, the Scratch Rice crispy Treats, which I, which I like a lot. So I had one of those, as well as a 24-ounce bottle of water. This bottle, to be specific, right here. And then... With that, I had 3,000 milligrams of sodium through uh, switchback electrolytes. So that was three servings of electrolytes. Uh, And I I drank that from basically eight and drank that from 5 to 5.30 a.m. Then I took an Uber from the hotel over to the uh, marathon start line. Got to the start line around 6 a.m. Went through the the bag check and security, all that. Uh, Fortunately, I, I got there... Uh, a little bit earlier, uh, it was like right at 6am, uh, basically when they recommended people to show up, but there was no lines at all, like I walked right through security, took like two seconds, none of the porta potties had lines yet, so if you're running Chicago, I definitely encourage you to get there somewhere between 5.30 to 6am, and you'll have a much less stressful time, I would imagine, you can get up to the start of your corral, you can get through security and all that stuff without having to wait in line, waiting, without having to wait in line, and uh, yeah, so... Make note of that if you're planning to run Chicago. But after I got there uh, around 6 a.m., I took with me uh, more electrolytes, a Morton drink mix, uh, and then all my gels. So I had, oh, and a packet of two before. So once I got in, I mixed all that. 
It was a Morton drink mix 320, a packet of two before, and then another 2,000 milligrams of sodium uh, through electrolytes. So two servings of electrolytes. Mix that all together in a bottle, chug that over the course of like an hour basically from six to seven just kind of sipped on it right before the race started once i got into the corral i threw a gel down uh so the race started at 7 30 it was probably 7 25 about five minutes before i took a gel a morton 160 just to make sure we had a gel in our system already going into the race the race started at 7.30. And then throughout the race, uh, just kind of go through the race nutrition, it didn't go as good as I was hoping. Um, I kind of struggled to get gels down, unfortunately. Uh, my plan was to do a gel every four miles, so 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20. So I had five gels with me total. I think altogether I was only able to get down three of them. The one at four went down just fine. The one at eight went down fine. Uh And then that's where it kind of got weird. Uh, Mile 12, I kind of struggled to get that one down. I think I got about half of it down, and I ended up just tossing the other half because I'm like, nope, it's not happening. Um, And it's not even like I couldn't – it wasn't like my stomach couldn't handle it. It was just like I was running so fast that like I was breathing so hard. My heart rate was so high that like even trying to just swallow it was really hard, and I – my like my mouth and my throat was just like heaving it up essentially before I even was able to swallow it. And so I spit it out. Uh, I still got like half of it down. And then basically the same thing happened at mile 16. Uh, I got another like half a gel down. And then uh, I only had one gel left on me uh, from 16 to 26. Um, And I was going to take it around mile 20 or 22. And I looked at it, I pulled it out and I was like, this thing ain't going down. So I literally <laughs> just chucked it across the course, uh, into like the, where the aid station was at. And, um, yeah, so I basically did the whole marathon in three gels, which I would not recommend that because I could tell by the end of it, like the last three to four miles, I definitely was lacking on some fuel. I, I was like really just feeling gassed. And I know that if I had an extra gel on me, it would have made a big difference. So that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. You got to adapt on race day, be ready for anything. Uh, one thing that I do think helped me a lot was I had a handheld bottle. I had the, it's the Nathan XO draw. And the nice thing about this bottle, uh, as opposed to a lot of other handheld bottles is it's like a soft flask with this like handheld thing around it. And so it has pockets on the outside. I shoved all my gels in there. So I don't have to worry about where I'm going to fit them in my shorts. And then, uh, because it's a soft flask, as you drink it, there's no air in there versus like the hard sided ones. As you drink it, it's like sloshing around because there's all the air in the bottle. So this one, it just shrinks basically as you consume the liquid, which is nice. And in that bottle, I had another Morton drink mix 320, which is essentially like two gels worth of carbs. And then I also had another 2000 milligrams of sodium from switchback. So I think that handheld bottle with the liquid calories definitely helped me. Um, And I think for future races, what I'm going to do is try to stick to liquid calories as much as I can, as opposed to the the gels. The gels are easier, more convenient for sure um, than having to like somehow get a bottle on the back half of the course. But I'll figure that out at a later date because the liquid calories are just so much easier. And I think that's what a lot of the elite people are doing now too is – at least during races from what I've seen is just sticking to the liquid calories with a bottle as opposed to carrying gels. But again, it's easier for them to just because they have a a table for the, for the elite runners, which is nice. Um, for us regular folks, we have to figure out a way to, uh, somehow grab another bottle on the back half of the course, but we'll figure that out at a later date. So that is the nutrition strategy. That's how it went down. Pacing strategy, how it went down. Uh, the next question, I got a lot of questions about the GPS issues with Chicago, which, uh, I was definitely concerned about this going into the race because everybody was telling me about, Oh, your GPS isn't going to work. Forget about your watch for the first few miles. Just manually lap every mile for the race. I anticipated that going in. I planned on doing that, but fortunately, like I didn't really have any GPS issues. Even the first mile, there's like a half mile stretch where you're just under this really long underpass and you're like, like closed in with these buildings. Uh, you can't even see the sky. And my GPS, when I got to mile one, as soon as I hit mile one on the course, my GPS, my watch said mile one. And so it was literally spot on, which was surprising. Uh, it did get kind of funky, uh, from like two to three. And then from, I think it was like 12 to 14 when we got back into the city, just cause all the buildings kind of mess with the GPS. 
but surprisingly, I think my watch ended up logging like 26.4 miles as opposed to the 26.2. So it was off by like 0.2 altogether. But really, I didn't have to worry about the GPS too much. Um, I just kind of took mental notes of like where my watch would beep when it was at uh, hit the mile mark as opposed to where I was at on the course. So I kind of knew I was going to be off by like maybe 20 to 30 seconds uh, um, from what like my, my time was saying, if that makes sense. So I, I knew that like my average pace that my watch was telling me was probably a bit faster because on my watch, I think it ended up saying 613 per mile, whereas the actual like uh, chip time was 616. So I knew that going into it. So that's just like a good thing for people running Chicago or any race at all is like making sure you know uh, or like paying attention to where your watch is at in relation to like the actual time on the course. All right, the next question is weaving in and out of crowds. I had a few people ask me about this. Uh, Fortunately, in Chicago, I didn't have to worry too much about the crowds. Maybe the first mile or two, it was kind of crowded, but I feel like the way the crowds are set up, uh, and they they actually make you verify your time, at least for Corral A, and I think maybe Corral B too, um, they make you verify your your, anticipated finish time by showing what you've ran previously. And so I was able to get up in the fastest corral, which was nice. I didn't have to worry about dodging too many people because in Boston this er, this year earlier, that's probably what prevented me from, uh, it's easy to blame it on this, but probably what prevented me from hitting the sub 250 I was going for there was the first three miles of the race. We were just stuck by all these people who were running their goal time like five to 10 to 15 minutes slower than what we were trying to go for so right off the bat the first three miles in boston we lost like two or three minutes off of our overall time because we just couldn't get around people the roads are super narrow you're packed in really tightly and i think we were just too far back in the corral so fortunately in chicago i was definitely worried about it but fortunately uh there was no issues with that um i had to bob and weave a couple people but one piece of advice if you are in a corral at the beginning of a race and you're trying to weave in and out of people, um, I would recommend just sticking to the outside as much as you can. Don't go in the middle. That's what I did in Boston and I got stuck there forever. So go to the outside of the, of the corral and like the, you know, the edge of the course and just run there because every, it's going to be congested the most in the middle. If you just stick to the outside, it's easy to hop around people. You can go in and out a little bit easier. So that's what I would recommend there. Uh, I had a question about preventing chafing. Uh, I chafed hard. You won't be able to see it because I've got a t-shirt on. But like I always chafe so bad here under my uh, like tricep area and then my lats. It like rubs so hard that it chafes. Like it's all scabbed up right now. You can't see it. But <clears throat> um, I put chafe cream on, but apparently not enough. Uh, and then I also tend to chafe in between my thighs and like down in that region. Uh, fortunately I didn't have any issues with that area for Chicago, but I, I do use this stuff. It's called salty britches. It has worked amazing up until this point or so far. Obviously I I just don't think I put enough on, uh, or it could have rubbed off like from taking sweatshirts on and off before the race. But yeah, salty britches has been amazing. I also put this stuff on my feet, uh, to prevent blisters it's called Sport Shield. It's like this green stick, and you just roll on this liquid chafe gel all over your toes. Uh, I don't get any blisters anymore. I just get terrible blisters. I don't know if it's because of that Sport Shield or just like my feet have become acclimated to running. But yeah, I would say prevent blisters and chafing as much as you can because that's like one of the worst ways to ruin a race. Like if you're fit, if your nutrition's good, all that, and then you have to, you know, suffer through chafing, that just sucks. So. Salty Britches and Sport Shield has been amazing for me. Uh, a few people asked about bathroom breaks. I don't ever stop to go to the bathroom during a race. Not because I don't have to, like, not because I don't have to pee, but it's just, I, in my opinion, I, I cannot let a bathroom break make or break <laughs> my goal time. Like, in my opinion, I can hold it, you know, for two, three, four hours if I need to. And I would rather hold it. Honestly, I'd rather just pee my pants at that point. If it's like, if I have to go so bad that it's either going to come out or I have to just stop, I would just let it come out to be honest. But I think one way to like easily prevent having to go to the bathroom is to just be intentional with when you're drinking and like test all this during training, like determine, okay, if I stop drinking 30 minutes before my run, 
and I, you know, I get in a quick pee before the run, am I still gonna have to pee during the run? If you're still RPing, then you're gonna have to bump it up to like 45 minutes or an hour. The next question, I actually got a lot of people submit this question uh, about my heart rate being so high. Uh, why was it so high? How was I able to maintain it at that level for so long? And am I worried? Am I ever worried about it being so high? Uh, first off, I'm definitely never worried about it being that high. Um, in my opinion, or at least in my experience, I w- my body will stop. Like my my brain or whatever will force me to stop running before something bad happens. Like, I don't know whether it'd be like a heart attack or something, but like I, I am more than comfortable of pushing my heart rate and my body as high as possible. Uh, because I'm just comfortable enough knowing that like, or assuming that I will stop and walk or something like everything else will hurt so bad before my heart gives out that I'm, I'm never truly worried about that. And I don't think anybody really should be, unless you obviously have like history, family history, or like, you know, other experiences with cardiac, uh, issues. But if you're a normal, healthy person, I don't think you need to be worried at all about your heart rate being high, uh, quote unquote high. Uh, my average heart rate for this marathon, according to my watch, obviously take this with a grain of salt because it was just reading off of my wrist. Uh, but it said 178, I mean, I was definitely pushing it, uh, the later miles, I was probably like low one eighties. So definitely quote unquote high, I suppose I have no clue what my actual max heart rate is. I would guess it's probably somewhere in like the mid to high nineties if I had to guess, but who knows in terms of marathons, like that's how my heart rate is for every marathon I've done. It slowly starts around like 150, 160, a little bit above aerobic threshold. And then it shoots up into like 170s, 180s for the rest of the marathon. So uh, in terms of like how to maintain that, I guess just like if you train properly and you're really pushing yourself uh, and you're hitting those paces, matching that same effort through training, you just build up a, a tolerance. It's again with marathon training, like our bodies are so are capable of so much more than we ever think. And so a lot of marathon training is just developing that mental callous and that mental adaptation to like that uncomfortable feeling that we get when we run and it hurts and our bodies and everything is telling us to stop but how to push through that I think it just comes with time and experience and knowing in the back of your head that like when it gets to that point you can still keep going if you really need to so I'm never worried about my heart rate being too high when it comes to a race or a workout and I don't think you should be either and as far as maintaining it just keep spending more time doing it and over time you build up this this mental toughness and this mental callus to like get comfortable with that uncomfortable feeling another question i got from several people uh is how to deal with cramping fortunately i have never dealt with cramping i've only cramped up one time ever and it was during my first 50 mile race uh because i was just like wildly under fueled with electrolytes and hydration since then i learned my lesson uh and i am usually overhydrated, not not over, but properly hydrated, uh, which feels like you're overhydrated, basically. Um, and so I, I've never dealt with cramping. One interesting thing on cramping, too, is there's a study out there that talks about how uh, or that proved that muscular endurance from whether it's running uh, or strength training actually has m- more of an effect on preventing cramping than even sodium. I don't remember exactly how the study went, but essentially they were able to prove that even if you're uh, sufficient with your sodium levels and electrolytes, that if you're not properly trained from like a muscular endurance standpoint, that that can still outweigh uh, the sodium uh, effect. So basically meaning, yes, you need to load up with sodium, but more than anything, you need to train uh, your muscles to be able to handle running 26 miles. And so, um, I think that's again, another reason that people need to strength train runners, especially is you're not only building up strength and that connective tissue within all your joints, but you're building that muscular endurance to prevent cramping, prevent bonking, and just make your muscles more efficient as a whole. I'd say to deal with cramping, First off, make sure uh, that you are loaded up on sodium. And second, make sure that you strength train and just work on that muscular endurance, which just takes time. Uh, It's an answer that nobody wants. 
Uh, and then I guess this is kind of a, a similar question, uh, but just avoiding bonking, <clears throat> excuse me, avoiding bonking and avoiding hitting the infamous wall that most people or a lot of people tend to hit from 20 to 26 typically. Very, very similar answer to the last question is I think it comes down to fueling and what your training looks like. Uh, if you're properly fueled with gels, carbs, water, electrolytes, that's an easy way to prevent bonking and hitting the wall. And I again, I think more than that is just proper training, making sure you're getting in sufficient amount of long runs, lots of long runs over you know, between two to three hours during your training, matching marathon pace deeper into those workouts by like either incorporating intervals into your long runs occasionally or doing like a fast finish long run where you do, for example, like 14 miles easy and then you do the last like six miles uh, from 14 to 20 like fast at marathon pace or something and just getting your legs used to running that pace deeper into the workout. So again, to avoid bonking, hitting the wall, proper hydration, proper nutrition, early and often on those things, uh, during the race and then proper training going into the race. Uh, again, a lot of times, like if you didn't train properly and you're just like going in on a prayer, basically to not hit the wall, you can do all the nutrition and hydration. It might work for you, but more than likely your muscles just don't have the endurance and you're probably going to cramp regardless. Another question mindset when it got hard. I love this question. And I kind of briefed briefly touched on it earlier, but <clears throat> I, again, I think knowing ahead of time, that you're going to inevitably hit a point in the race when it gets hard and you want to quit. So knowing uh, what you're going to tell yourself ahead of time when that when you get to that point, I think that helps a lot. And then some other like little tricks and things that I, I tell myself when it gets hard during a race is I just tell myself it's not going to last forever. Like a lot of times the last, you know, six miles of the race, it's, I can kind of do the math of like, okay, I'm doing about six minute miles. I've got about six miles left. That's going to be 36 to 38 minutes roughly, uh, of running. And I just kind of start counting down the minutes. I'm like, all right, 35 minutes, 30 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, and just kind of chunking it up instead of like miles. Cause sometimes the miles at that point feel like forever. Uh, and so it's easier to just chunk it up into minutes because it's like the minutes tick off quicker. So it's like you're getting those wins more frequently, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, but I also, at the same time, like to not look at my watch as much as possible. I know it's hard to later in the race, but I try to avoid looking at my watch and really just running based off of feel at that point. Uh, I think that helps because if you're looking at your watch every like 30 seconds, every minute, it's going to make it feel much, much longer and slower than it really is. And again, I kind of just tell myself like, Dude, you train for this, you put in the work, trust the process of everything you put in up until this point. You knew you were going to get to this point, so just keep pushing forward. You told yourself you are going to do this, and you're ready. And one other thing that I actually think about, um, I really leaned into this during Chicago, was when I got to mile 20, I like assessed how I felt, assessed the pain in my legs. It's like, yeah, it hurts. I'm breathing hard. I'm sweating. My legs hurt. But like... I'm okay. Like I can still keep going if I have to, like, I don't need to stop. And then I, I compare that feeling at mile 20 to how I felt at like mile five or mile 10. And usually it's roughly the same. It might be like a notch higher, but I tell myself like, okay, I felt kind of like this, like mile five or 10. And that was like two hours ago. And I, I, so I've been through this uncomfortable feeling for two hours. And you're telling me you can't push for another 30 or 40 minutes if you need to. And I think that helps a lot because it like it gives you that confidence and like reassurance that, like, oh, shoot, we went from five to 20 and we kind of felt pretty uncomfortable through that. Well, why couldn't we go another five or six miles? Um, and so it's like kind of tricking your brain and using these like psychological little tools um, that are obviously going to resonate with you. Everybody's different. So kind of finding what those are and finding that through training and, and then implementing that during race day. This is, again, a similar question like managing pain, discomfort, negative thoughts. Uh, one of my favorite things for negative thoughts uh, and dealing with it is like, it actually came from a podcast I did with uh, Jeff Browning earlier. He's like one of the top ultra runners. I think he's the second most, or the second winningest uh, ultra runner uh, as far as 100 milers go. And he had this idea of like, your thoughts are these seeds that pop up in our brains. Like we don't really control what thoughts pop up. It's just like whatever pops up, pops up. Those are our thoughts. But then if you think of them, think of those thoughts as seeds, uh, you can water those seeds. And the way you water a seed is by thinking about 
that thought. Uh, so there's a difference between thoughts and thinking. So these thoughts pop up, these little seeds, your thinking is the water that you pour onto those seeds or onto those thoughts. And you, the best part about this is you get to choose which seeds you're watering. Are you going to water the positive ones or the negative ones? Are you going to think about those negative thoughts or those positive thoughts? Or are you just going to let the negative ones pass by, run their course through your brain, and then they're off uh, and they're gone forever? So I kind of like to think of that, of like when a negative thought pops up, I just try to not think about it. And I just try to think of something positive. Um, So I, I like that mindset a lot. Uh, and the discomfort thing, like it's for sure uncomfortable, but you know, that's where training comes in and, and just being used to that feeling and being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, somebody asked, uh, this course versus Boston versus Eugene. So, uh, Eugene, if you didn't know, was where I broke, uh, the three hour mark for the first time. That was May of 2022. So a little bit over a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, Eugene is a great course. I love that course. Super flat and fast. I think there's about 400 feet of elevation gain. Uh, Chicago is about 230, 240 feet. Boston's about 950 feet of elevation gain. Uh, net downhill, but a very, very hilly course. Um, the weather across all three races, for me at least, were very similar. It rained in Boston, so that was fun. Uh, definitely added an element, but uh, as term- in terms of like temperature, Across all three, it was almost identical between like 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absolutely perfect for marathon running. Uh, Eugene's definitely a smaller race. It's not a world major or anything. It's like 5,000 marathon runners, maybe. It's pretty small, Um, especially compared to Chicago and Boston. Chicago was for sure the easiest course out of all of them. Chicago was such a flat course. There was a couple of inclines here or there. I wouldn't even call them hills. Like They're really just these little short overpasses or like these little inclines to like get on top of an overpass or like a bridge and like the downtown area going over the river but like like by the time you actually started to feel the incline you were already like at the top basically so it was like very minimal uh there was one i would consider it a hill probably around i think it was like somewhere between 20 to 22 um there's all these people dressed like cows i just remember that i was like deep in the pain cave so (laughs) i don't remember exactly but um, all these people dress like cows. There's this little hill. There's like, uh, I don't know, maybe like 400 meters long. Not too bad, but that was probably the largest hill. And of course, uh, it's the last like 400 meters of the race. You're coming down Michigan Avenue and then you take a right onto Roosevelt. Everybody calls it Mount Roosevelt because you're at 26 miles. You got like 0.2 to go. And you got to go up this long, steep little incline uh, to get over this bridge before you get to the finish line or it definitely doesn't look like a mountain, but it, I would say it feels like one when you're right, when you're 26 miles in and you know, you're so close and the whole course has been so flat. And then out of nowhere, there's just this freaking steep incline. So that's, uh, that was challenging, but it's like, at that point, you're so close to the finish. You're like, all right, just suffer through it. Just get through it. Um, but I will say logistically, Chicago is such a great course. Um, Eugene was great too. Super simple. Boston was more complicated mostly because it's a point to point course. You got to like take the bus out and you got to leave early and it's a really late start and there's all these waves and all this stuff going on. So it's very complex. Chicago is so simple. I mean, you walk in through security, it's very, it's laid out very easy. You just find your corral. There's so many corrals that like, they're all not super, super crowded. So it's easy to get in and out at least where I was. And it's like, I, you could just walk right to it. It's an early morning start at seven 30. You don't have to like wait around for hours and hours um, like you do at Boston or from what I hear from New York. So very uh, efficient course. I will say that they, they did a really good job. Next question. This marathon versus my first marathon. Oh, boy. Uh, my first marathon was a shit show, to say the least. Uh, it was the uh, the BPN marathon that I did here in January of 2022. And I had the wise old decision to try and qualify for Boston and run sub three at my very first marathon. Uh, I had done two sub one thirty half marathons, which like on paper should translate to a sub three. Uh, my training was definitely not what it should have been. Uh, I think my peak week was like 45 miles. Most weeks were like 35 to 40 miles. Definitely not running enough. Kind of always dealing with like little injuries and stuff. Didn't do any strength training. Didn't know anything about nutrition. Didn't carb load. Uh, the night before I had salmon and asparagus, if that tells you anything, I did take gels, 
Um, I was doing gels like every like four to five miles. Actually, I think it was like every six miles or something. It was definitely not enough gels. Um, the course was definitely hillier and windier and it was just a hard course in general. So like I, I for sure bonked at like mile 20. Um, I remember also at the start, I, to run sub three, you got to average like a 650 pace. And I was like, you know what? This is what everybody does when they run their first marathon. You know what? I'm going to be feeling really good early on in this marathon. I should bank some time while I'm feeling good because I know it's going to suck at the end. So genius move that was. I went out and ran like 620 for my first couple miles. Way too fast. It should have been like 650, 655 uh, for the first few. Instead, I just go balls to the wall. So I was on pace for a while up until about 18 or 20. Uh, and then it all just fell apart around mile 20 bonked pretty hard. Uh, I think my last, my like 25th, 26th mile were like eight minutes a mile. Like my legs were just bricks way under fueled, way under trained, no pacing strategy. I still somehow ran three hours and 54 seconds. Uh, I, I still have no clue how I did that to be honest. Um, pure grit, I guess, cause everything else was incorrect that I did. So, uh, yeah, that was the first marathon experience. Um, didn't walk or I walked, but didn't barely didn't run for like weeks after that. Um, so sore, just laid on the couch. Uh, again, nutrition was like non-existent. Yeah. The first marathon was a wreck. My toes were wrecked for sure. I lost several toenails there. Uh, and yeah, just a mess. But now this is my fifth marathon in Chicago in the last two years and feet feel fine. No issues, no injuries legs felt fully recovered about two to three days after the race it's crazy how much you can learn within just a couple of years or not even not even a full two years like what is that 20 months basically that should serve as some confidence for you guys that you can start where I was uh yes I know three hours is fast for a first marathon I I can't ignore that but like the way I felt it was just terrible I felt like zero out of ten during and after that first marathon and then fast forward about 20 months later, and here we are, doing much, much better, and running a much faster time, so hopefully that serves as some confidence for you guys. Uh, Next question, how to run Chicago, Uh, yeah, like how to get into the race, and then any tips for the race, Um, I've kind of gone over some of the tips, but how do you get into Chicago, similar to all the other major marathons for the most part, is either qualify, Uh, I think for me it was either 305 or three hours, uh, so I was able to qualify for this, fortunately. Uh, if you can't qualify uh, or you're not there yet, you can get in through the lottery, which is obviously one of the harder ways to to go about it. Just toss your name in, hope you get picked, uh, and then that's it. Uh, and then you can always raise money for charity. Uh, and this is what I'm actually doing for the London Marathon for 2024. I've never actually worked with a charity to do uh, a race, which I'm super excited about that. But basically you partner with the charity, they have to pick you or select you because there's minimum, uh, or there's, uh, a select few spots available. And then you raise money, uh, through your friends, family connections, whatever. And then whatever, uh, funds, if like, if you don't hit the benchmark they set for you, you just got to pay the rest yourself. So that's always an option, but I would highly recommend Chicago. It was an amazing race. Like I said, efficiency wise like very very well run race uh super easy to get in and out of like the post race party was great easy to find family members and stuff yeah i guess tips for chicago in general uh i kind of went over a lot of these but like show up early i'd I'd recommend that for any marathon like you can't show up too early if it's like crazy cold or something like you don't want to be outside in the cold for too long but just wear clothes get some old hoodies or gloves or beanies and pants and just toss it right before the race starts. So you're not standing out in the cold for too long for Chicago, like try to stay as close to downtown or like to Grant park as you can. So then you can just kind of walk to everything, like walk to shakeout runs. Uh, you probably couldn't walk to the expo. That's kind of a ways away. Uh, but you can walk to the start line, to the finish line. They're all kind of in that same Grant park area. I would also recommend, uh, buying like the it's like the priority or like vip kind of pass or something i didn't get it but a few of my friends did and it seemed really nice where their family members could just go and hang out in this like vip section during the race and even before like you can hang out there before the race too which is cool it's like you got your own bathroom you can sit somewhere warm and heated uh you can like get out of all the crowds and all that stuff uh and then 
after the race, or well, I guess during the race, your spouse or family or whatever can hang out in there. They have food and snacks and all this stuff. And then after the race, you can go in there, change, hang out there if you want. It's like more private and you have more room and whatnot. So you're not by all the people. I definitely recommend that. I think it's like maybe 150 bucks or something. I don't remember exactly. But uh, that and then the uh, I would also recommend the east side viewing area. I, just, I lucked out and got a ticket for this. Um, I had my videographer there. Chris, who was filming the finish line, but I got an email from the marathon. Uh, like two minutes later, I went on and bought the ticket. I went back the next day to try and get it, and it was already sold out. It was like twenty dollars, but basically, it allows whoever's there spectating you to get to the finish line. Uh, so they get videos of you, cheer you on, see you uh, right at the finish line. Um, so that would be helpful too. But yeah, those are kind of broad tips, I guess. If you guys have specific questions about the marathon, just shoot me a DM or email or whatever. And I can try and get back to you. Uh, what did I change to PR this marathon? Um, honestly, <clears throat> from Boston, which I did in April, so about six months ago, to now, I didn't change a lot. I would say if I changed anything, it was just more strength training, like more intentional strength training, like specifically like the band work and the single leg stuff. Like I, I also implemented, I guess, a second leg day. That's probably pretty big. Uh, so every week, for the Chicago Marathon prep, I did two leg days. One, uh, either Tuesday, Wednesday, whichever day my speed work fell on for the week, and then one leg day on uh, Saturday after my long run. Uh, and I think that helped a lot. Again, like the idea of you go do a really intense workout in the morning, a, a speed workout or a long run, and then in the afternoon when your legs are already tired and beat down, you hit them again uh, with a leg workout. And everybody thinks it's crazy. It sounds like so challenging, but it's like, it's not like the, the soreness from the workout in the morning doesn't really set in until the next day anyway. So like, it's not that hard in my opinion. I think if you just choose the right weights and you take some time to really acclimate your body, it's not that bad. It sounds bad on paper. It sounds intense, but I promise it's not that bad. That was a big game changer. And then band work. I did mini band stuff essentially every day, uh, where I do like kickbacks i would do the like lateral walks the uh like crab what are they called the crab things you know what i'm talking about um and then the like hip thrusters with the mini band squats with the mini band uh it takes like five minutes it's all body weight stuff you just throw a mini band on around your legs go through the motions uh and i have a video about this somewhere on my instagram uh and you just go through the motions of that every day i think it does wonders for blood flow, helps loosen everything up, activates those muscles, uh, especially the glutes. Glutes, from what I've learned, are typically the source of most running injuries, weak glutes or just deactivated glutes. And so I think that's what uh, the bands help with a lot. So to summarize that rambling answer, what I changed to PR for this race, more intentional strength training, more band work, and uh, adding in a second leg day for strength training. Recovery post marathon. Oh, this one kind of sucks for this week, to be honest, because uh, the day I got back from Chicago, uh, the race was Sunday, got back late Monday night. Tuesday morning, I woke up just sick. Not that sick, just like sore throat. My body felt super depleted. Uh, I knew I had some kind of bug or something. I had a little bit of cough, and like sinus shit. And unfortunately... I, I don't, well, fortunately, I rarely get sick. It's like one to two times a year I'll get sick. And it's usually for like two to three days and then it's gone. Um, but the last time I got sick was the day I got back from the Boston Marathon. And I started looking it up because I'm like, there's no way this is just a coincidence. The only time this year I got sick was right after I did a marathon. And so I looked it up and apparently it's very, very common with marathon runners or endurance athletes where you do a big hard effort uh, in a race and then you get back home and you're traveling and all this stuff and you get back home and then you're sick. And so, uh, it makes sense because like we were in Ubers, we were in airports and airplanes, going to the expo, the shakeout run, talking to hundreds of people, uh, at the race itself, you're in the corral with all these people. Like I was just around people in stores and shopping and elevators in the hotel and all this stuff, just around people the whole weekend. Uh, plus you add in a marathon, a very hard exerting effort on your body. So your body's kind of beat down, your immune system's weakened and then around all these new germs and people. Uh, so it just makes sense. Uh, but 
from my muscular recovery standpoint, my legs felt good uh probably by like Tuesday or Wednesday so about two to three days post marathon legs felt pretty much back to normal I really wanted to go run but I I was sick so I couldn't really um so that kind of sucked but uh I guess to answer your question about recovery post marathon walking is probably the number one thing I would recommend after the marathon on Sunday Bree and I walked like two or three miles to our lunch reservations we actually had to run a little bit because we were going to be late so <clears throat> run slash like our light jog slash walk to our lunch reservations for a couple miles and then went back to the hotel chilled for a couple hours and then later that night walk, I walked another like two or three miles to go meet up with some people for dinner walked back uh, so lots of walking and active recovery and it's just that blood flow that helps and just that motion I would say motion is the lotion because it's so true the blood flow and just that range of motion, getting your knees and your ankles and your hips and everything moving uh, is really what helps speed up recovery, at least for me. So even like the day we got back uh, from Chicago, like went for a 45 minute walk with the dogs, just getting everything moving uh, and then also doing uh, some strength training or even just like body weight stuff, just really light weight body weight stuff uh, doesn't need to be anything intense by any means, just going through the motions, doing some squats, doing some lunges getting that range of motion in and getting the blood flowing. That is what our bodies want uh, is in a, in a time of recovery is just blood flow, blood flow, blood flow. And that helps me. And I know that it can help you guys out too. So I encourage you after any race to walk, any big workout, go for a walk. Uh, it helps a lot. And then just get in some light strength training too. Uh, and then I also obviously try to prioritize like drinking as much water as I can. Lots of electrolytes. Uh, trying to eat really good, high-quality foods. Right after a marathon, you want to eat some carbs. Uh, I know you're probably sick of carbs after a marathon, but your glycogen stores are depleted, and your muscles need glycogen. They need the carbohydrates to function, and so you want to dump some more carbohydrates back in right after the race. Uh, Same thing with protein. The protein helps the recovery process, creatine, all these different things uh, that most people talk about, Uh, and for good reason. Uh, You want to just try and get as much nutrition and high quality nutrition in as you can in the days after the marathon even like the whole week uh post marathon it'll help a lot oh and one other point i want to add to the recovery side of things is everybody thinks that inflammation is bad when it comes to uh after a workout or after a race like yes inflammation is bad on like a daily basis if you're constantly inflamed that's not good you probably need to figure out what that is but if you feel inflamed after a big workout or after a race, that's good. You want inflammation. So that's why I discourage anybody from hopping in a cold plunge like right after a, a big workout or right after a race. Uh, and that's within like a four to six hour window because your body, your body's natural reaction to stimulus and stress is inflammation. And that's how it you know, promotes blood flow. That's how it recovers. And so f- blocking that inflammation through like a cold plunge or like an anti-inflammatory pill like ibuprofen or tylenol or something that's just going to stop that natural process from occurring so i'm not a doctor by any means so this is not medical advice but i in my own experience within like the first six hours of a big race or a workout do not take uh, i'll say this i do not take any kind of inflammation blocker anti-inflammatory or any kind of thing that's going to do that because it blocks the good inflammation um but i will say after the race you know, after that like six hour period uh like the next morning Brie and i went to this bathhouse it was called like ra bathhouse or air bathhouse a i r e and basically it was this giant underground building uh with all these different big baths and pools and steam rooms and cold plunges and for like 90 minutes, we just cycled in and out. We'd sit in the steam room for like 15 minutes. Then we'd hop in the cold plunge. Then we'd go sit in this like hot salt bath and we'd like float. And then we would go uh, back in the cold plunge. And then we'd go into this uh, like jet pool where there's all these jets blowing on you. And then you go back into the cold plunge and just cycling in and out. And that contrast therapy, uh, I think that made a big difference for recovery too. Uh, Obviously, it didn't help with the cold at all, but I think from a muscular standpoint, it definitely helped a lot. So if you're going to use a cold plunge, if you're going to use any kind of like anti-inflammatory thing, just make sure you wait at least six hours after your race or after your workout. Um, Okay, got a few questions left. 
how to go from a four hour marathon to sub three. This is like the million dollar question, right? The average marathon time, uh, from what I know is around four hours and everybody wants to get that like coveted sub three. There's a lot of things I could tell you and you could probably gather a lot of that from what I've already told you in this podcast, but I would say there's, there's two main things that's going to take you from sub four or from a four hour marathon to sub three. And that is consistency and patience. If you can be consistent for, I don't know, some people it might take six months, some people might take six years. If you can be consistent for that amount of time, show up, strength train, run consistently, take care of recovery, sleep well, good nutrition, good hydration, and you can be consistent and most importantly, being patient and trusting the process of everything and just showing up day in, day out, you know, being able to, to put in the work without seeing direct results and just show up and do the work and be patient for however long it takes. That's what's going to get you to sub three. You can be a six hour marathoner and get to sub three. It doesn't matter where you're starting at. Everybody, in my opinion, can truly run a sub three marathon it just takes some people longer than others, but as long as you want it bad enough, I know how cliche and cheesy that sounds like. If it's something that you want bad enough and you're willing to show up and put in the time and the work and the effort that it requires, you can for sure do it. So all these like little details, they're great. They can make, you know, the one, two percent difference here or there. But as a whole, from like a macro point of view, be consistent and just be patient. And I promise if you do those two things. You can get wherever you want to go. You can go run a 244 marathon if, you, if you're consistent and you're patient and you just trust the process of everything. So it's uh, unfortunately the answer that I know nobody wants to hear. Everybody just wants the like quick fix of, oh, if you just run this pace for this many miles a week, you can run sub three. But instead, it's like it's all these little things in addition to the big ideas of consistency and patience. So that's my answer to that. All right, two questions left. Uh, balancing training with life. I had a lot of people ask this. Uh, and it's tough for sure. And I actually put out a post about this the other day of like, what's the hardest part about a marathon? Is it mile 20? Is it the cramps? Is it the nutrition? I said, for me, it's not any of those things. It's really, it's like the sacrifices you have to make to even get to that point. Like waking up early every morning, going for a run, missing out on like Saturday morning family time or, or Friday night out with friends because you got a long run that day. Like you, everybody makes, if you're training the right way. You have to make sacrifices in, in some regard, whether it's for sleep or family or friends or your social life, your kids, whatever it is. Marathons are hard. Marathons are taxing. They require so much time and energy. And they're really basically like, a, I don't know if, if it's a full-time job. I'd say a part-time job between you know 10 hours of running a week plus another five to 10 hours of strength training and recovery and, you know, spending time on nutrition and all this stuff, it becomes a part-time job essentially. And so you're going to have to sacrifice something. And, uh, I would say if you had to prioritize what to sacrifice, sacrifice, you know, time you spend on your phone or time that you spend out with friends drinking or, you know, doing things that aren't really going to benefit you, uh, and just prioritize your, your, life for four months and make some sacrifices to like how much, uh, you know, like what, what are the things that are going to help you succeed and become a better person? Is it spending three hours a day watching Netflix or is it going for a run for an hour and then spending 30 minutes in the gym, uh, and then spending an hour watching TV? It's like, you can still do those things. It's just, how are you prioritizing? How are you managing your time? Uh, and obviously everybody's situation is different. Like I don't, I'm fortunate enough, I guess, to not have kids <laughs> depending on how you look at it. So I don't have that, but we have two dogs, two golden retrievers who are basically children. Uh, I've got a fiance who we spend time together on a daily basis. We go out on the weekends. We, we go do family things. Um, I have friends I want to hang out with. I have like businesses to run and build and you know I'm coaching clients like there's a lot that I do and everybody's busy everybody has their own things everybody has kids or a job or whatever it is and so it's just prioritizing what's important to you and hopefully those are things that are going to make you better and uh, contribute to your success and your health your fitness your family and your work um, I think those are pillars of life. And so making your decisions around those, I think that's how you balance marathon training 
with life. Last question, uh, winter training, how to train through the winter, uh, slash off season. Uh, I'll start with like the off season stuff. Uh, so for me, I try to do like, at least lately, last couple of years, I try to do two big marathon efforts per year and try and space them out about every six months. I don't know if this is true, but I think that's why the, all the major marathons are spaced out the way they are. Tokyo, London and Boston are all in the spring in like March or April. And then uh, Chicago, Berlin and New York are all in the fall in October and November. And I think it's because like for elite runners and everybody else, like it's best to go for a PR about every six months or like a a big effort every six months. Like you don't want to be doing it more than twice a year in my opinion. And so I like to do this cycle where I do about a three to four month block of training, run the marathon, let's just say here in October. Then I'll take like November, December to just kind of chill, figure out what else I want to do, maybe do some like base building, like just some really long, easy runs, not do a lot of speed work or uh, kind of shifting gears and like reducing running volume, but doing like more intense speed work where like you do some 100 meter sprints, 200 meter sprints, uh, just some like really short, intense stuff to like work on that top end speed. And then after that, like two month block, November, December, then like January, I'll pick it up again and I'll start training again for my marathon in London in April. And then following London, I'll kind of repeat that same thing. Uh, Like April, May, June, I'll kind of chill out a little bit uh, and I will maybe uh, chill out in terms of like intensity of the, the training. I'll still probably keep maybe around the same time spent training roughly. We'll see. Uh, this year might be different because I'm running a hundred miler in June. During the summers, I definitely like to incorporate more trail running, more like base building, longer, easier miles, a lot of hiking, whenever possible. Um, so that's just how I like to do it. Say like July, August comes around, then it's back into marathon training for like that fall marathon. So again, everybody's different. That's what I prefer to do. That's kind of like the off season stuff that I like to do. I also like to work on strength a lot in the off season. So like. November, December now for me is going to be like really focused on like deadlifting heavy, squatting heavy, bench press heavy. Like I might put on like, you know, another five pounds of muscle if I can eating a lot more, running less and lifting more for the next couple months. Uh, and then it's kind of the same thing with winter training, uh, as it's basically the same thing is I will eat more. I'll increase my calories a little bit. I'll run less. I'll probably put on a little bit of weight so that I can gain some muscle. Uh, I'll lift heavier and uh, just really spend more time lifting, honestly, probably like at least an hour to an hour and a half a day for like five to six days a week. I'll still probably run four to six days a week. My longest run on the weekends, uh, on on average, it'll probably be about 10 miles up to like maybe 13, 14 miles, so nothing too crazy long. An average day of running will probably just be like three to five miles easy. And then uh, probably like a either a fartlek session in the middle of the week, or like I said, some like shorter interval stuff, like uh, like 100, 200, 400 meter sprints on the track, just to work on that top end speed. I will say I would love to at some point do a 500 pound deadlift and a sub five mile. That's definitely on my bucket list. Uh, I don't know when that'll happen, or if I will ever do it or if I'll actually spend the time to to work towards it because it would basically be a whole training block in itself. But I definitely would love to do that at some point. And then I would also love to eventually do an Ironman. Uh, I've done one sprint triathlon, and I would really love to do an Ironman at some point. And then High Rocks. High Rocks seems very interesting to me. Uh, I know a few people that do it, and it seems like a lot of fun. It feels like something I would be decent at because it's definitely more cardio-based. But it also requires a little bit of strength. Uh, and it just seems like a fun race, like a whole new community to be a part of. And I don't know, just something new to train for, a different style of training. Uh, so I, I guess in the in the immediate future, the London Marathon in April, I may do the Austin Marathon in February. And then I have the Bighorn 100 miler in June, which is in the mountains in Wyoming. And then I will be doing <clears throat> the New York Marathon in November of next year. So that's kind of like the next 12 months, roughly. I may mix in like a high rocks or something like that. I want to for sure do the six major marathons, uh, get the six stars, 
Uh, I'll have that done hopefully by the end of 2025 and then probably shift gears into uh, maybe like an Ironman. I definitely have a lot of like 100 mile races on my bucket list I would love to do. So who knows? I want to just keep staying healthy, keep doing cool things, um, traveling, seeing the world, seeing you guys building a community, uh, being a part of the running community which I think is the best community in the whole entire world. So welcoming and encouraging and just like so supportive of anybody and everybody. And I, I love it so much. Um, but that is the podcast for today. I really appreciate you guys listening. I feel like this was just an absolute ramble fest from me, but uh, hopefully you guys got something out of it. Hopefully I provided some value. I hope that uh, you can learn from all my mistakes uh, and some of the few successes that I've had and uh, use them to implement them into your training so that you can get a PR, you can hit the goal you want, whether it's qualify for Boston, finish a marathon, run an ultra, whatever the heck it is. Uh, I hope you guys can uh, you know, use this information to go out and do those things. So again, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you in the next one.